Hello and welcome to Inside the Museum with Tudor House Museum um, Peoples. Uh, we're broadcast, we're recording in December, but we'll actually be recording this in January. So um, if our weather references are wrong now, we apologise. Uh, we've got several people with us, but I will let Anna introduce after the twiddly music. Cue twiddly music. So hello, I am Anna and I am the Engagement Officer at Tudor House Museum. I'm Louise, I'm the Collections Officer at Tudor House Museum. Thank you, Abby. Hi, I'm Abby and I'm the Learning Officer at Tudor House Museum. And Tim. Hey, I'm Tim and I'm a volunteer at the Tudor <laughs> House Museum. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. You're on token mail again, I'm sorry. One day we will bring in more boys for you to talk to. <laughs> 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 oh. Oh, right, Anna, take it away. Yes, so um, as you say, we are recording in December, but this is going out in um, January, which yes. is going to be a whole new year um, for, for Tudor House Museum. Um, hopefully a bit of a better year in terms of visitor numbers um, than 2020 <laughs> has been. Um, although I in think- In terms of not... everything. Yes. <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> it has been an interesting year, I think, uh -huh. is one way to, uh, yeah. to describe it. Yes. Um, what we kind of wanted to do today was because this is the um the first the first podcast of the new year is kind of bring the whole gang together, so to speak, um, and talk about what our plans are for the the coming year, 2021. Obviously. I think the number of times we say COVID restrictions permitting in this podcast, <laughs> if we turn that into a drinking game, we'd probably be sozzled by the first sort of 10 minutes in. Um, but obviously it is very difficult to know what we will and won't be doing. But we do have yeah, plans. Yeah. We um, do. We have very exciting plans. I now have plans to create a new drinking game. Well done. I'm always on the lookout for those. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So, yes, Judah House reaches the uh, the, the, the um, drinking industry. Watch out for that, 2021. Yeah. yeah. I think everybody listening, take it as read that this is COVID restrictions permitting. Otherwise, if we keep saying it, we'll just drive ourselves nuts. As today, the first, as we record, um, the first person ever to receive the vaccine had it She's in her 90s so I think everybody's watching the poor woman like a hawk now to see how she reacts to it yes <laughs> then it's if it was me I'd want to cue. cough or something to, uh, to just uh, kind of see her really kind of recoil in horror but yeah, yeah. and the, yeah. the second so person be... was William Shakespeare did you see that the second person was called <laughs> William Shakespeare no no <laughs> from, from Warwickshire as well you actually That's made incredible. me stop in my tracks then really Yes. That's yes. mad. I guess. Any relation? Probably. I hope so. Well, it's not that common a surname, is it? <laughs> no. That's going to no. be the pub quiz, pub quiz question of 2030, isn't think it? I so. Oh, yes. 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 Hook that away in your mind. Yeah. Wow. I hadn't realised that. Gosh. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> So once we have all received our vaccines, um, uh -huh. we will all be free to visit various museums. Of course, that will be the first thing on everyone's list oh, to, absolutely. Um, to do, mm -hmm. of course. Um, but yeah, it will be really nice to get back to you, hopefully touch with some semblance of normality. Um, are we allowed to share what the plans for Tudor House are for January on this broadcast at the moment? Or would you rather we cut this bit out? <laughs> 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 well, once we've cracked the Enigma code, uh, mm -hmm. no, <laughs> it's not top secret information. Um, in fact, anybody who's been within conversational range of me um, in the last few months will know that we have been creating new um, display boards and exhibitions to go around the museum. Um, that's taken quite a bit of time and thing and throwing with the designers and um, the writers and things like that. So um, that's all finished and the boards are being created over um, December and they'll be installed in January. Um, so that's our big January event, basically. The museum will be closed until February, so you won't be able to come in and take a sneaky peek um, before it's all ready. But yes, January is the installation of all the new displays, all the new activities, um, the family trails, everything. 
um, goes in in January and then we open with a bang, a metaphorical bang, not a literal one. <laughs> don't want everything falling off the walls um, in February. Uh, so yes, that's, that's what's happening really. It's the culmination of um, three years of planning and 12 months of doing. So um, I'll be very glad to kind of see it all open and finished. And then I move on to the next big project. So. Yes, stay tuned for February's podcast to find it's out. It's not what like I get to put my feet up and go, that's it now, I'm done. I'm never fundraising again. <laughs> so you mentioned putting things on the walls and I have, yeah. um, I'm going to ask the very silly and perhaps obvious question. Tudor yeah. House is a 16th century building. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming we can't just get a bit of blue tack and blue tack it up onto those lovely old 16th century walls. How are the new display boards? What are they going to look like? How are they going to stay on the walls? Well, it's funny you should say that because um, <laughs> in previous years, that's exactly what had happened. People had um, laminated A3 sheets of paper and then blue tacked them to the walls because um, mounting an exhibition is expensive. Mm. and funds were very tight and actually the money we've got to create all these new displays has come from the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Um, so with, that means we've been able to invest in creating these great big um, beautiful A1 sized boards that will be hung properly. I haven't got into the discussion about how to hang them but I have seen the many many emails that have flown between chair um, Jim from the first podcast and another trustee and the designers about what they can use. They could use something called command strips, which is basically extra strength Velcro that sticks to the wall. So it's blue tack with knobs on um, and then sticks that only just stick the board or they could use um, fishing wire attached to hooks. Um, luckily, because it's such an old building, um, the former inhabitants have over the years very thoughtfully put in lots of handy hooks and nails into the beams so we can actually just use a lot of them um, to attach the boards using fishing wire. Um, so I've, I've kind of stayed out of the logistics, I decided it was an engineering job and as Jim and John are both former engineers they can do that bit. <laughs> yes, I think this is called making use of the expertise to hand or something. Yes, delegation. It? I'm constantly being told to delegate, so I delegated that one out. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's really nice, though, because, I mean, the boards will look really, they'll look fantastic when they're yeah. up, and um, it's really exciting to be able to sort of share some of the new research that has been yeah. found into some of those former inhabitants. It was lovely this year to lose all those um, blue tack marks, because blue tack's the very devil of a substance. As handy as it is, it just leaves grease marks all over your walls. And after it's been up for a while, when you pull it off, it actually pulls off chunks of paint and plaster. So to have that kind of gone is wonderful. We've got all these pristine walls now that look beautiful and really show off the building. And when the new boards go up, um, they won't damage the walls in any way, shape or form. So it'll be really nice, really lovely to see, really kind of top professional job coming up. Yes. So Tudor House is definitely, when, when people say like, oh, well, New Year's resolution, I meant to, you know, change my appearance this way, that way, or the other way. We are going to be the first people in the history of the world to actually succeed at that New Year's resolution, I think. Yes, it will be the first inanimate building to achieve its New Year's resolutions. <laughs> well the only done, thing it won't do is lose any weight. <laughs> no, <laughs> in fact, it will probably gain some with all the lovely new display boards, but you know, yeah. we'll forgive it. It's all fine. It's yeah. all good. It won't be the only one. Yeah. So, um, speaking of um, sort of research that we have undertaken into into the museum, and also speaking of some of those former inhabitants who were handy with the old fishing hooks and whatnot, um, this seems like a really nice time to bring in Tim, our resident <laughs> researcher here. Who, what he doesn't know about um, some of the former inhabitants of the museum, well, it just frankly isn't worth knowing. Um, so Tim is going to give us another breakneck biography of one of the uh, former residents. Who are we going to go and visit today, Tim? Right, so today, because um, we alternate male-female, we're on a female mm -hmm. uh, month, and <laughs> I'm going to talk about Martha Wood, okay. who oh, was yes, a Martha. milliner by trade uh, in the last 
quarter of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, wait for it, joke coming. It's a rags, rags to stitches story. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's it, you're cut off at this point. No more comments allowed. Because, more comments uh, yeah. allowed. Yeah. Yeah. I've been working on that one all week. <laughs> oh, gosh. Here all week. Elvis too. has well, left the building. Absolutely. <laughs> now I know for a fact that Tim has found pages and pages and pages of research about Martha, who is a very fascinating character. But of course, the whole purpose of this is that you have only two minutes to give us their life story before you are silenced for good. This is the beauty of, uh, of Zoom. So, Tim, I will that give you a countdown. Really and then you have three, uh, two <laughs> minutes. Never silence me for good. Extra minute there. <laughs> you have two minutes to tell us all about Martha Wood, starting in. Three, two, one. Right, well, Martha Wood wasn't a milliner to begin with, neither was she Martha Wood, obviously. Uh, she was born Martha Russell, and she didn't even come from Worcester. She was from Somerset. A um, little bit of doubt exactly where she was born, but Yeovil was where she grew up. Um, she, on her parish records for when she was baptised, the, uh, the clergy or whoever very nicely put BB in the margin. And that uh, led to a little bit of head scratching, but BB means bastard born. There is no evidence of a father on that record, so we can pretty sure that she was born with father absent or uh, maybe even not known. Five years earlier, her sister was born, and although it doesn't say BB on her record, there's no evidence of a father either. Now, if I was a Victorian middle class gentleman, I might be using the prostitution word here, but I can't, so I won't. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's something to think about. Um, despite there not being a male around the family, Martha and her mother, who was called Martha rather confusingly, and her sister, Susan, did manage to make ends meet. Um, her mother was a glover, and uh, the daughters very soon after that became glovers too. Um, however, it would have been a poor existence, and along comes William Wood, shining knight in armour, and says, let me take you away from all this. And he does and takes her to Worcester. Um, they're not, they don't set up a shop immediately. They live in New Street, but in 1876, they're in uh, Tudor House, number 39, uh, with this millinery business, six children, no less, and making a go of it. And they're there until about nine, 1891, when sadly William dies, and the family then moves out to College Street. And ultimately a very sad end to Martha, which I'll leave you hanging on that one. You're going to have to uh, read my write-up on the blog to find out how rags to stitches and then not quite rags, but rather an unhappy ending. There we go. That was two minutes on the dot. It's oh. almost like you have timed that. It was it, incredible. It's getting better. I'm sorry. I don't I have my own clock running. I must admit, I have my own clock running. But <laughs> as I said to Anna uh, via via chat yesterday, it's it's better for me not to overthink this thing and just mm. go in with a few notes rather than having read my long uh, my long Timo uh, treatises yeah. on the on the subject. As I said, this will be up on the uh, the blog by the time uh, the broadcast goes out. So uh, if you are interested, Excellent. please go along. And I Thanks, hope that Tim. at some point somebody will give the URL for the, the website and everything. Yeah, um, that was really interesting. I, so I stifled a chuckle when you mentioned um, code words and possibly her mother being of loose morals um, and then them being glovers and things like that because it just reminded me of the Terry Pratchett Guild of yes. Seamstresses. Yes. <laughs> just um, a euphemism. I, could, I can add a little bit if I'm allowed to. I found uh, an article which wasn't in a Worcester paper and I can't remember exactly which paper it was but it was mm -hmm. written by somebody, actually it was a letter, by somebody called Humanitas which seems to be a, a, a nom de plume of a group of people and he was saying, why are there so many prostitutes in Worcester in particular? And goes on to say, it's because of the gloving trade and all these female glovers who aren't paid enough. So when the light goes and they can't stitch anymore, they have to go out and walk the streets. It's, it's uh, very resourceful of them, I have to say. <laughs> unfortunately, uh, that argument has been told a million times about every trade through yeah. uh, through the ages for, for the... Uh, pull down trodden female worker and like you say terry pratchett picks it up and I, yeah that's why i wanted to say that because i said to me anyway, when we went bursting into the front room to tell my family this wonderful discovery and they said what do you mean like in Taylor, terry pratchett <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> he is universal that's interesting and actually that that could take us on to conversations for hours about women's wages and 
Oh, it's not. I say, the, is the heritage sector next? Is that where we're all going? <laughs> <laughs> Can we move on? Oh, God. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, we should, because I can't think of anything appropriate to follow that comment. Yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Louise and Abby, would you like to introduce yourselves and tell us what you get up to in a good, clean, wholesome way at Tudor House? Yeah. Tell us about your day job. Yes, yes, yes. Louise, do you want to come first? Yeah, um, so I was bought in in July this year, sorry, last year, and um, have been basically just a bit of emergency looking after the collections, working out what we've got, where it is, where it's come from, um, still working it all out um but yeah really exciting we've got some good stuff in the collection a really nice really nice collection of world war ii stuff that most people will be familiar with if you visited before um and I've, on the table in front of me i've got a lovely box of stuff that's just come back from the archives it's all been lovely and cleaned from our um, finds that were found in the ceiling when the ceiling was done oh, yeah. so um they're a bit less mucky now and i can actually read what it says on them <laughs> they were they came out in such a state that you'd pick them up by the corner with finger and thumb go oh my god where can I, where can i put this it's just filthy it was crud of the ages stuck to the surfaces <laughs> yeah, Rhonda at the hive, the Rhonda Rhonda at the hive reckon there's probably anthrax on them so yeah <laughs> oh god <laughs> Yeah, we don't get danger money. <laughs> They're clean now. They're all clean. Thank yes, thank oh, thanks to Rhonda for her yeah. valiant efforts. With that. <laughs> so how did you fall into the museum sector, Louise? How did it draw you in? Oh, not falling. I was curating my bedroom ornaments from the age of 12. <laughs> <laughs> Did they all have little labels that had sort of, you know, when, when they were acquired? And... No labels, but I was writing little books of what, I think my mum thought I was writing shopping lists, but I was just writing down what I had in my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> that was probably my very first emergency plan, uh, but yeah. yeah. Um, I've been really lucky actually, I've worked at lots of different places in, in the heritage sector over the last sort of 15 years. Um, yeah. And yeah it's been it's been nice all over the west midlands um as well as at tudor house i'm currently working at the um george marshall medical museum and also at the museum of royal worcester so yeah all in yeah. worcester at the moment which is very rare to be able to walk to all of the places that i work um oh yeah, it it's good. makes such difference yeah. being able to walk though doesn't it mm. rather than commute um yeah so that's that's the epitome of a patchwork career isn't it really but it's excellent. I really like it because it means you don't get bored in one place for too long or doing the same thing all the time. But for those who don't know, what's the difference between a curator and a manager? Because people assume, as I'm the manager, I'm also the curator and I have to disillusion them. Okay, well, I suppose that Tudor House. Uh, uh -huh. uh, uh, yeah, no, okay. So at George Marshall, <laughs> the word curator is flung about quite yeah I, I'm, yeah I'm the manager really but if there's if just me so it's always been called curator actually I think when the job was first advertised when the George Marshall opened in 2002 it was learning officer and then oh, it changed really? because they realized there was so much collections work along with it and they wanted someone that could do a bit of both so um mm. yeah I think a curator would traditionally be involved in researching the collections and looking after the collections uh, whereas manager would be well everything else yeah, <laughs> yes. still up your role there. Just everything. <laughs> yeah, everything else. That is pretty much it. Yes. Yeah. So, what is it you love in particular about collections work? Oh, I'm so I'm such a loser. I just write, like writing lists. I like to know <laughs> <I like, laughs> where stuff is. I, I like it to be clean. I like it to be labelled. Yeah. I like it to be where it's supposed to be, so that when you want to put a really nice exhibition on next year or whatever, you can go to the box and it's in there. I know. Like, oh, finding God, something it, in the box that it's supposed to yeah. be in, like the best. It's just like yeah, Friday night. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> So I have a question Aww. about your sort of object stuff and you don't have to, you, you can answer this sort of anonymously. Have <laughs> you ever lost something or broken something in a museum collection? And as I say, you don't have to tell us which one it was at Hermit Tudor House or otherwise. <laughs> no, I've not been here long enough to break anything at Tudor House. Uh, I have broken one thing and it was actually in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> 
was at the Museum of Royal Worcester and it yeah. was an accident and it was a new acquisition of um, something that we actually had already. It was a duplicate in the collection. So I'd say it was probably destined for the handling collection. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's the very first thing I broke. It just fell off the table all by itself. I just, you know, I was just stood right next to it when it happened. It's the ghost. Yeah. It's Dr. Wall. <laughs> But everyone's <laughs> broken something in museum collections. We oh, do our right. very best, but everyone's broken something. Yeah. yeah. We lose things all the time. It's so easy. Yeah. When you yeah. think of the hundreds of objects you're dealing with, sometimes just in one room, let alone in one building, and then you've got different people coming in to loan it out or use it as handling collection, or they're moving it from one display case to another and they don't update the database. So you've gone, well, it should be there, but it's not. And then you've got a 10 room building to try and find a small, tiny object. It happens all the time. One of the museums I worked in years ago, um, it's a beautiful 14th century building and the collection was vast. There's thousands of objects in there because they've been collecting for about 50 years. And it was, you know, it ranged from nails for horseshoes up to Anglo-Saxon burial treasure. So it was a vast range, but the smaller the object, the more likely it was somebody, one of the people who were involved in helping with the collections would have in the past said, I don't want it in that case. I want it in this one. And that's in a room halfway around the other side of the building and didn't tell anyone that they'd done it because they could back then. It was more... There was more enthusiasm than method in those days. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, thank God we now have location and movement um, forms. But, yeah. Can I jump Louise. in with the question? Yeah, sure. So Louise, what have you fixed whilst you've been at Tudor House? Anything in particular you've been managed to put back together from a sorry state? Um, My appalling filing system? <laughs> no, no, there's nothing wrong with there's nothing wrong with the filing system. In terms of putting stuff back together, do you mean like actually mending an object? Yes, or, indeed, yes. Indeed. Uh, no, the, nothing's the, broken. The inverse of the broken Worc Worcester pot. No, there's nothing broken that I found in the collection apart from a teapot in the kitchen where a bit of the spout is not there, um, but it's just in the teapot. So, that it, and it's part of the handling collection. It was always it was always just going to be in the kitchen, uh, but no, nothing's actually. Not it's not usually the job of a collections officer to actually mend something. So usually the breaks part of that object's history, um, unless it becomes completely unusable, at which point you send it off to a conservation specialist somewhere um, to do it properly. And that costs a fortune. So we try not to break them in the first place. And then usually if it comes to us broken, that breaks part of its history. Um, which is really what important. A cop out. Wish I could say that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, dear. The lawnmower was broken when I got to it. <laughs> it's part of its history. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> oh, just so to say, yeah. Tim, we don't want that lawnmower. Don't bring it to us. Oh, you don't want it. <laughs> there is a museum of lawnmowers somewhere, though, isn't yeah. there? I'll go try oh, yeah. them. <laughs> there we go. Phone them. Yeah. Up, see what the heck is like. So I have a question, and and um. Again, this is another very basic question, so I think I'm going to be asking the silly ones. You mentioned a handling collection. Is a handling collection, is that always sort of perhaps replica stuff that can be pulled out for, for school visits? So I don't know if Abby would actually answer that, that question. Or is the handling collection stuff that's kind of maybe not as valuable that you can let people have a go at sort of touching and feeling? How does that work? Do you want to tell everyone what you think a handling collection is, Abby, and then I'll tell you what I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> that means I might be wrong. <laughs> Well, the handling collection isn't necessarily replica um, objects or, or or objects that are made for for schools or um, uh, workshops. It can be something from the collection that you think we've got duplicates of of this, and it can safely be handled, and um, it, so therefore it can it can be put in the handling collection. So it doesn't have to be a replica object. But it has to be something that can withstand many um, ten-year-old hands <laughs> picking it up and putting it down, and you know. Um, so, so perhaps something like porcelain <laughs> in the porcelain museum. There may not be so much um, handling collection. I don't know in the porcelain museum that 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 children can get their hands on. But um, at Tudor House, we've got so we have got lots of things that are 
real objects, but we've got lots of things that over the years people have made, like replica, replica costumes, replica tools, um, uh, things like that, which are, you know, sort of, I suppose the replica objects are the best things for children and groups and families to, to handle really, because if something does ever drop off a table, then uh, <laughs> it's not going to matter too much. Uh, it's replaceable. Yes. See, my definition is anything that's replaceable, basically, or that yes. you've got multiples of. So, Louise, your definition. <laughs> <laughs> I think my definition of a handling slash education collection has changed drastically since I've been at the Tudor House Museum. Okay. <laughs> um, I've spent the first, I've only been on a 30 day contract so far and I've spent the first 15 days working through the boxes in the attic store um, and bits that were on display in the cabinets when I arrived which have all now been removed. Um, and most, half of the stuff, whether or not it was replica, with or without provenance, um, with or without anything interesting that went with it, um, it seems to be part of the handling collection. And it's only now that I'm, as I'm crossing down my list of the inventory to work out what's collection and what's handling collection, mm. that actually there's some really fascinating stories in the handling collection that probably for some reason, I don't know why, I, don't, I have no idea why it was added to the handling collection, not added to the permanent collection. Yeah. Um, but it's, yeah, I mean, what did we find the other day, Tony? There was a, a, a bag made out of the leather from a oh. bus seat. Yes, yeah, that's it was amazing. in the handling collection. But <laughs> yeah. you think actually that you could just put that on display on its own. You wouldn't want people to be picking that up and opening the cases because it, that's quite um, something special. You're not going to find many of those in the world. I think it, it arises when you have museums that start off volunteer led and they do this amazing job of bringing in things from their own past and from their friends past and their families um, but they're not entirely sure whether it's museum worthy so to cover themselves it either all becomes collection or handling and if they think it's not valuable then it's handling and it's free for anyone to kind of pick up and open up um, if they think it's valuable it'll go in a case or in a box um, never to be handled again. So I think that's where the confusion can arise. And that's why we've got, we had a lot of handling collection. Um, and then once you start adding replicas into the mix, you're just <laughs> expanding it out <laughs> all the time. Um, replicas are incredibly handy just because, um, you know, as Abby said, they can be knocked off the table and replaced. You don't I have ask to worry for about a them. professional's description or definition of provenance. 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 <laughs> just where it's just where it's from. Who's donated it? If it if it's not about who's donated it, it's who it belonged to. Um, can you tell us a bit? Basically, we shouldn't really be accepting anything into collections in museums anymore without knowing where they've come from. The whole point of the of the object is a story that's behind it. That's what everyone finds fascinating. Um, mm. So you know, if if you if it's a find in a charity shop that's okay but it's not great unless that's something really rare that you definitely want to add to the collection because you don't have that already in terms of everything else um you want to make sure that you know who owned it who loved it who used it who wore it um to be able to tell that object story properly it yeah, also I guess, I guess it knowing... adds so much more depth to the item doesn't it the, like you say the yeah. warmth of that story mm. also knowing the provenance um saves you from accusations of receiving looted items in the future. If you've got the history of where it's come from and who's had it in the past, um, you know that it's fairly safe for you to have it in the museum. If you don't, if you can't tell where it's come from, then who's to say it hasn't been stolen at some point yeah, and never recovered? My, my layman's definition of provenance, but uh, mm -hmm. Louise has built on that and yeah. more practical everyday kind of uh, description of, of what you mean by it. Thank you, Louise. Oh, brilliant. So, um, Abby, we kind of brought you in there a little bit to talk about handling collections. So you are the, the education officer at Tudor House. So what do you actually do with the handling collection other than give it to two 10 year olds to play with? I assume it's a little more complicated than that. What does your, what does your role involve? involve? Um, well, I so I started at the museum um, in May 
2019 and um, sort of started straight away with the with the school visits to Tudor House. Um, so I think I was only there a week or so and, and I think five were, were booked in the first two weeks. So it started, <laughs> really, it was really, really busy. I was really sort of... We wanted um, to see if you'd sink or swim. <laughs> yes, I was really kind of thrown in at the deep end. And although I'd, I'd done, um, you know, I've delivered workshops before at other museums to, to school children, it was the first time that I'd had to kind of... Uh, think about all the kind of elements of admin and 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 sort of sorting them and delivering them and sending the invoice afterwards and all that sort of thing um so so my so when I first started that my main kind of role was organizing marketing and and delivering the workshops for children and at Tudor House it's mainly primary school I don't think uh Apart from the home educators that come, they are now all secondary school age. They're, they're around year seven, seven, eight, nine, so around 11 to 13 years old. But Tudor House is really, really, what I found out is it's really suited to primary school children because we've got quite small rooms. And if you have children with really big arms and legs and school <laughs> bags, they just don't fit into our... Um, <laughs> Into our, a picture. Tiny rooms. <laughs> I've worked with six, I've worked in my past, I've worked with six formers and discovered like how how like six formers six form boys' arms and legs and school yeah. bags just stretch absolutely <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. They're never ending. So, so we have to have miniature people and I'm sort of fairly miniature as well, so I fit in right well, really well there. <laughs> We should say at this um, point, Abby is only 5'2", so she gets to use words <laughs> like miniature about herself without any... <laughs> yes. I get, yes, I get very annoyed if children are, are much taller than me when they're sort of in year seven. <laughs> yes. I always say to year seven and eight, I don't like it when you're taller than me. It's like you, yeah. you have to be shorter than me to be my favourite person. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so well, I mainly do, I mainly do the, um, the school groups and we offer the World War II workshops and the Tudor workshops and um, so I've developed those a, a little bit. We used lots of volunteers in the past and um, of course uh, you know in recent in recent times I've had to kind of think we haven't got all the volunteers to help out with with school groups um, so so trying to make the workshops as as workable as possible without too much manpower has been one of the things that I've I've tried to do a little bit although we've got lots of willing volunteers that like helping out with the workshops and that's really nice. Um, the home educators I've developed and that's been nice because they're return visits and so I get to know a group of people and I've so over the last year and and probably about a year um, you know get to know some some children that are return visit visitors and that's really nice and getting to know their parents as well because um, mm -hmm. that is something that I really like to do I really like working with families actually and um, so yeah that's something to to build on working with with families a little bit more yeah um, I, yes. I like that it's part of that um uh, what's the word? It's that learning, but learning beyond the school years that I think is really important. If you yes. facing your learning program on school children, you're kind, of, you're cutting off your nose to spite your face because there are so many people, more people who want to learn as well. So to be able Definitely. to develop the family side of things is really good. And we've actually yes. just restructured for next year so that Abby will be able to do more family learning activities at weekends than she can do at the moment, which is brilliant. Yes. Yeah. As, and as I think... a home educating parent or was, my, my yes. kids have grown up, I have to say that Tudor House has a long tradition with home education. My children used to come before it was the independent museum and they loved it. They were there the day it closed and they cried oh. and they came afterwards for the first five years or so before, before any of you were there. Um, but the initial... Uh, um, thing and my, my wife helped out with some of the uh, activities in there so it's just great to see that's continuing and growing and you'll always get the home educators there and you'll always be challenged by them because 
that's what a home educated children child is they're looking at everything they're thinking outside the box they're poking their fingers everywhere and uh, you know you you'll go into some very strange pathways but it's always fun and enjoyable yeah i think they're encouraged to question more when they're home educated well, it's um, not a question of encouraging it's not discouraging yeah because when you're in school you've got the peer pressure and you've got you know maybe Time you've got tables. a sarcastic teacher who's not going to uh, treat a bad answer well there's nothing nothing no such thing as a wrong answer or a bad question mm -hmm. it's just you know getting people to think and uh, yeah they're encouraged to I like, I, like the more, I like the more sort of I could it's a little bit more informal and relaxed when you have home educated because you've got a smaller group you can get to know them as individuals and um you uh, in schools you're on a real tight timetable it's always mm -hmm. like it's really snappy the way you have to do everything with a school group and you're always kind of thinking you're always looking at your watch with school groups to think right but 35 minutes has gone we need to get onto the next workshop and now we now it's lunch and now we need to get them so that they're you know so that they're kind of in the courtyard and ready to go out because they've got to um walk back to school or get onto their coach and you're really on a timetable with schools whereas it's so nice to feel a bit more relaxed with the home educators um it's a it's a whole different kind of atmosphere really mm. i really enjoy I, I like the home educators a lot <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah and they're and they're this year they're they're the only this current this um term they're the only people i've seen obviously because uh, although um schools did book they booked during the october uh the, no, the november lockdown mm. and so they had to to cancel um so that has so this yeah i mean i plan to do museum um what i call museum takeaway boxes and other um museums call them loan boxes um and so like september was the perfect time to really launch all of that and i had a little run of museum boxes going out all the time and and uh, the last one is coming back this friday Mm. And that's been something that I've been able to focus on and and will probably mark it again at the beginning of next year and and even try and extend that um, the, the museum takeaway box range because mm. um, they've gone down well. And although not many schools have borrowed them, they've borrowed almost all of them. So they've said we'll have all of the Tudor museum takeaway boxes that you've got <laughs> and so that has been so that's been really good in the last yeah. few months to be able to kind of keep going around to Wilkinson's and buying more plastic boxes <laughs> <laughs> what I seem to have done but um it's that's been something nice to focus on and mm -hmm. and I'd never done museum takeaway boxes before so that was new to me to set that up so without kind of giving away all the trade secrets, so to speak, what kind of things go into a museum takeaway box? Is this sort of stuff from the handling collection that you're learning out of schools? Or is it yes, so we're going, well? we're going right back to replica, <laughs> lots <laughs> of replica items. Um, I don't, I don't think that I've put in anything that's an, that's an actual nice object in the in the um museum takeaway boxes when you uh, say nice do you mean original yes original <laughs> <laughs> it's awful um, the stuff we're sending out is awful we <laughs> shouldn't be scared to abby we've got uh, handling boxes at george marshall medical museum we put like authentic stuff in there and it always comes back absolutely fine do you, i'm trying to think if there is something that i send out in the um perhaps in the world war ii boxes yeah. but i don't I don't think there is. So there's lots of replica costumes, and over the over the years, lots of people have sewn costumes, and I did quite a few over the summer, so that I could kind of extend the costume collection. And then realised they'd make brilliant sort of museum takeaway. You know, I'd fill a museum takeaway box with Tudor costumes. <laughs> um, but I decided to add some notes as well, um, because especially for the Tudor boxes, um, primary school teachers don't necessarily, you know, they don't know absolutely everything about the um, 
you know the topic that they're teaching that's why they come to a museum to kind of add to the children's learning and probably add to their own learning as well so there's also so I do write some notes because one teacher was very worried that I was going to give her a box of objects that she wouldn't know what a single thing inside it was so apart from a from a very detailed contents list which is useful for counting all the items back in again it also uh, it also kind of helps identify what all the objects are um, because especially you know with costumes um, you know a teacher might know what um, an Elizabethan ruff might look like but they might not know what a, like a doublet is or britches or something like that so I just try to make it as user friendly as possible and then I do add, I do add in like in, uh, along with the notes I do sort of do suggested activities as well um, so and whether they use them or not whether they have time for them or not it's just a, a kind of a, a bit of an extra mm -hmm. Uh, thing. Mm -hmm. I did have one school phone up from North London asking if they could borrow oh, Lordy. a takeaway box <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I said I can't, it will cost so much to send it to North London just for two yeah. weeks. Um, but they... Had they realised where we were? Well I did say, <laughs> I, did that, I did say, do you think we're in Worcester Park near, um, I think near Richmond? Yeah. <laughs> Because we're actually Worcester, Worcestershire. Um, so they did. They did realise where we were. Okay, that's but they good. Just, they just googled and found us, and must wow. have seen the takeaway boxes. But so I did send all the notes plus lots of extra things. They wanted something on Tudor buildings, and th and that box has got like a replica mallet and axe in it. So it's actually quite heavy. So it must have just been uh, far too heavy to post and far too big. Yeah. Um, but so the notes have be have kind of gone to London, which is quite nice. Yeah, it's really exciting. Good. Yes, yeah. Um, Abby, I wondered, um, and I sort of know know the know the answer to this question a little bit. I know that we've talked about um, Tudor takeaway boxes and World War Two, and that's because for anyone who doesn't know, um, Tudor House as it was during the Second World War was one of Worcester's ARP stations. So we have. A sort of a historic connection to the Second World War. Um, and I know that when you have school visits in the past, um, one of the volunteers at the museum um, was actually evacuated during the Second World War and he would come and speak to the children about his experiences. But actually you were able to do something quite interesting and exciting over lockdown with Alec and I wondered if you could talk about that because I find it really okay. interesting. Yes. <laughs> Well, Alec is a—he's a really um, lovely volunteer who um, he, he likes to remind me of his age every so often, which <laughs> doesn't change, you know, more than once a year. But he's eighty-nine, and and I'd said to him for a while, um, it would be lovely to record your talk, Alec, and we can use it in the museum. And he, and then he always says to me, yes, because I won't be around forever, which is not what I <laughs> say to him, but I. We managed to to record um, his his talk with lots of extra bits actually that he never quite gets round to to saying in the workshop because when we're with the school it, you know it we're on a timetable so um, my brother who's a sound engineer and has uh, because all his work was lost over lockdown has sort of become. Um, become a filmmaker actually and he's doing some work at the university as well making films now uh, so he said that he would help me make um, this film of Alec um, and so he really did a lot of the editing for me which was really really difficult because we filmed for about an hour and we needed to cut it down to half an hour so it was it was the film was cut in half really in the end but um so he edited edited it for me and added some nice photographs that were alex images so that we'd got um like um i think it's called an a the, the a roll and the b roll so it looked it looks really really nice um but that once it's finished it's it's now gone out into the um one of the World War II boxes, which is called Evacuee Experience, so that schools can watch 
the film and I know Alec has got some copies and he's sending one to the, um, there's an evacuee sort of uh, association. So he's sent Very one to the evacuee association and I think he's sent one to his old school or he's going to, he's sending one to his old school in London where he was evacuated from and he's sent one to the, I think he's wanted to send one to the school in Dawlish in Devon where he was evacuated to. So he, I get nice emails from his his wife Margaret to say he's absolutely thrilled with the whole <laughs> project, <laughs> and um, yes, I think he's he's he feels some celebrity status now that he's been filmed. <laughs> As well, he should. I guess. Yes. <laughs> yes, but yeah, that was a that was a really really nice project to work on because I'd work with Alex a lot and I'd heard that um, I'd heard his story a lot and it's a really different way for children to um, to learn and listen because um, Alec uh, sort of talks a little bit slower than perhaps teachers would it's not as snappy as as a kind of um, a, a lesson that you'd have delivered in a classroom it's a completely different way of listening for children mm -hmm. and he really does kind of it's very nice because he kind of they're, they're sitting there and it's it sort of it slows them all down for just half an hour to kind <laughs> of sit and listen and and really focus on something that's not very visual because it hasn't got you know there's not loads of kind of um, fast moving images or anything it is just listening to storytelling and I think that's a really nice way of learning actually mm. excellent thank you yeah <laughs> I think that's really nice as well because um we talk a lot not just at Tudor House but in the heritage sector generally about how the heritage sector has been so disrupted this year by everything that has mm -hmm. gone on yeah. and obviously you know for a lot of people have lost jobs it has been really terrible but there have been some positive stories to come out of it which obviously of course don't outweigh the negatives but it's really nice mm -hmm. to think that, that filming probably isn't something that would have happened um had we not been in lockdown and had that the, the pressure kind of not been there to to organize it so it is really nice that some things was yes there has been disruption some of it was perhaps more positive disruption than um than others definitely um, yeah yes yeah, I mean, yeah. being closed for that period of time meant we could work undisturbed on the restoration of the ceiling, for example. Um, we didn't have to worry about public safety because there was no public safety. So Adam, who's the intern working on it, could just crack on with it, basically. Um, and that meant we were able to finish faster than we would have done otherwise, which saved us money, which is always nice. And it provided opportunities because Arts Council responded really quickly with emergency funding for museums which we applied for and meant we could bring in Louise to do all this collection hey. work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there she is. bring her back into the conversation yeah. um, to do all this work on the collections because with the best will in the world it's not something I have time for and it's not my specialist area I mean I did have little collections of things when I was growing up but I didn't write <laughs> brochures about them so <laughs> never, that. never living that down <laughs> uh, you know a little inventory of my books no I didn't do that so um to bring in Louise who that is her enthusiasm and that is her special yeah. mm -hmm. the Arts Council emergency funding just meant that we could do that and we wouldn't have been able to otherwise so, so, yeah it's been there's been quite a lot of positives in amongst yeah. all the um negatives and I think yeah. actually it's nice to end this year or start 2021 kind of focusing on those positives because mm. frankly I've had enough doom and gloom. <laughs> it has been decreed only positivity from here on. <laughs> Absolutely we're all going to Pollyanna ourselves into some kind of happy coma. <laughs> <laughs> well that sounds positively positive I think <laughs> so there we go. It won't last because oh. my face muscles won't take all the smiling. So. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. <clears throat> so are we going to go ahead and talk about our um our sort of cultural recommendations with a sort of a, a looking forward vibe now? Does that sound like a plan? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um my kind of cultural recommendation um 
heritage site thing, um, I have to say, is a bit of a cop out because I have decided that my New Year's resolution, I want to visit 12 um, heritage sites, museums, cultural events in the Midlands that I haven't been to before because I think we all kind of get into a rut of going to our kind of favourite places and there's nothing wrong with that at all but I'm going to challenge myself to do 12 um, as I say museums heritage sites in the Midlands that I haven't been to before and if possible um, I would also like as a sort of a national uh, level to do the same thing but 12 heritage sites that I haven't been to before that aren't in the Midlands that are a bit further afield obviously this is all incredibly dependent on what does or doesn't happen with the various travel restrictions um, mm -hmm. but having felt quite kind of culturally deprived this year in terms of actually going to a place and buying a ticket and a little postcard mm -hmm. in the gift shop so you could show that you've been to the place. I'm determined to kind of make up for it next year and I'm going for 12 because that's the equivalent of one every month but I feel like it might all be kind of crammed into the summer when we can all do it outdoors over there what have you but that is what I am looking forward to next year. Tune in next December for my report on all 24 that? places. <laughs> so, yeah, we're gonna have to bring you back in December yes, for an update. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> your contract. Well, I can't believe this. You've been with us for over a year now, mm. but your contract actually ends with us on the end of February. It does, um, and we'll probably talk a bit more. I know. Yeah, <laughs> it's really sad. We'll talk a bit more of when we do the next podcast. Mm. But kind of, what are you going to do? How will you replace the gaping hole that Tudor House will leave? Well, I mean, <laughs> yes. the point, how will Tudor what House feel the gaping hole? I think I'm going to so have now. to come back in one of those fantastic costumes and be a mannequin. So you will find me in the Tudor bedroom standing up <laughs> in Mrs. Cottrell's outfit, seeing if I can pull it off. Do you know, the last mannequin we had, I decapitated, so I really wouldn't oh, do off. that. <laughs> <laughs> and there was ones that you should scare the children. Yeah, This is so, true, this is true. Yeah, the creepy dentist that used to have, he had to be roped to the wall because he couldn't stand up on his <laughs> <laughs> had hair that made him look like a Scooby-Doo villain. I can, beat, I can beat that, I can beat that. We've still got our mannequins at George Marsh. And our anaesthetist that sits in our surgery diorama has his foot screwed to the floor, otherwise oh, no. he falls over. Oh, no. <laughs> when oh, I worked, for well, the first museum I worked at, it had a mannequin for, uh, that was supposed to represent a monk and it had the monk's robe and he was supposed to be a scribe. Unfortunately, he'd lost most of his fingers. So he still had kind of bits of necks and bits of fingers. So you'd peer and go, oh my God, how long has he been there? Did you embalm him? Is he genuine? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm not a fan of mannequins. To get rid of the dentist, I did a, a social media poll and people could vote whether he stayed or went. Um, and I had to fudge it slightly because unfortunately two friends of mine voted for him to stay and it just tipped the balance. <laughs> so I had to get hold of my mum's social media accounts and vote, no, he goes. <laughs> <laughs> this is so how you claim away. a genuine yes. victory. It's like, I'll only go so far in the name of democracy. And then, it's, <laughs> you know, when I really want something, it's a dictatorship. <laughs> that sounds like a proper manager's motto. I think that's what yeah. you were. That's what you go when you get to that point. <laughs> oh, Abby, what are you aiming for this month? This um, month, this year, whatever, this, whenever. Ne so <laughs> next, next year. Mm. Um, well, I've been saying to a friend, and we've said this for about two years, that we really want to go to Charleston, which is in, it's quite a long way to go. It's in Sussex. And it's the house that um, Vanessa Bell and Duncan Grant lived at in the Bloomsbury group. And I just love that kind of, era of art and um and the house just looks lovely and the garden looks gorgeous um so we've been saying that we're going to do it and next year i really really want to go and do that but that is a math it's it's only in sussex but somehow it seems like quite a trek because you've got to get across london and all that sort of thing yeah. so it's but that's somewhere that i've really wanted to go and i follow them on instagram and um all their posts look absolutely beautiful and yes, it looks like a lovely house. So that's that's my um, one that I want to go to nationally. Um, and then, but nearer to home, I'd like to. In fact, I swapped an email with somebody that worked at that works at um, the learning officer at Selly Manor, mm. and and I thought I really must go to Selly Manor. They're a museum that's very much um, 
like Tudor House and um, and I'd yes yeah, so that's as soon as as soon as they're open I should really go and and explore another museum very similar to Tudor House to pick ideas from other people <laughs> <laughs> at museums at small independent museums um, caring and sharing <laughs> or no I'll put not I'll put that differently to share to share ideas not yes ideas. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But yes, so that's my one closer to home that I'd okay. like to go to. Nice. Yes. So I've just got two, Anna. I'm not going for 12. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, like they say, I did think that was a bit ambitious. And then I Very think about like, all the places I haven't been to this year because it's um, no. mm. lots of places closed for, it was really unfortunate, lots of museums will close for January and maybe up to February half term and just exactly. when they were sort of starting to think about reopening yeah the lockdown again and uh, no. yes, yes fingers true. crossed for a better a better 20, 2020. Tim what about you what are your plans for next year? All right, I'm going to go down the middle and go more to and less than 12. Um, okay. <laughs> the last I can't remember how long it is now four or six weeks I've been working on some research that Anna asked me to do to do with uh, the trades and occupations of the people who lived in Tudor House over the last 500 years. So we've, I've picked out 10 of the trades. Some of them are reoccurring, like Martha Wood earlier, the milliner. That was a whole string of uh, milliners. In there. And some just one particular example of, like a shoemaker back in early 1600s. Um, and the, and the, the, um, the aim was is to find out what they would have done, who their market was, whether it was local or uh, international, where they've got their raw materials from and maybe a little bit of political comment about the time um, when we came to the milliners there was a whole raft of stuff that they were using which we would have thought totally and utterly a no-no these days mm -hmm. things like uh, exotic birds not just the feathers the whole bloody things um, <laughs> exotic birds and skins and oh, all kinds of things that make my blood boil but it was obviously part of the uh, the way things were then which we have to accept and record and move on I guess mm -hmm. so from that I kept thinking this is great I can google all of this I mean this has all been done in the typical Tim Onions lockdown fashion is just sitting here googling and following the spaghetti trails and coming out with some nuggets of gold um, but what I really would have wanted to do to do this was to go to the reenactments, the recreations of these things. Now, there's one just down the road from the museum in the city museum uh, in uh, Fulgate Street. Got the original interior of Stewart's chemist shop, uh, which was on the mm -hmm. high street, so it's not ours, but we had a chemist drop shop in number 38 from get the numbers uh, 1850s. The guy was there, um, and it Probably wasn't quite as grand, but it was a chemist shop, so it would have had all those lovely bell jars and carboys and mm. uh, and mahogany desks and whatever, and all the yucky stuff like leeches and <laughs> uh, and all the dangerous stuff like arsenic and opium and laudanum and God knows what else. Um, so I would have liked to, that's my local one. I would have liked to have gone there. Mm -hmm. And because of the other trades, um, not particularly prevalent in Worcester anymore, I was thinking of places like Black Country Museum, uh, Blitz Hill, the Ironbridge one, Beamish, and I'm sure there are other ones which I don't know of now, but that's what I would intend to do in 2021 once the lockdown's done, is to get out of this corner of the dining room where I work and uh, see these things <laughs> in situ. Nice. Thanks, Tim. That sounds yeah. really good. I can't wait to see what you find out, frankly. <laughs> yeah. Louise, yeah. or do you need a little bit longer to think? No, I've already thought, I've already got it. Um, okay, go for so, it. So, again, this is good. I'm not going to come across well here. Um, mm. with, uh, my partner uh, lived on an estate where all of the streets were named after castles. Okay. <laughs> so, 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 we've had a challenge called the Richmond Drive Castle Challenge for a few years now to try and visit all of those castles. And oh, we were stopped in our tracks. <laughs> we, got, we got as far as visiting <clears throat> places like Arundel in Sussex and uh, going up to Richmond and then. That was it. So yeah, um, I'd like to, I'd like to visit a few castles next year. We've got a little map yeah. on the fridge. You got a list Aww. to tick off. We, do, we, we we highlight them and we've gone. And yeah, that that's quite nice because he likes the castles. I like the yeah. coffee shop. 
Yeah. <laughs> and um, we both like an audio tour around the castle as well. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, he gets the castle and then the next day we'll try and find some nature to go and see. So um, yeah, I'm going to go nice. and try and see. I think there's one on the Isle of Wight we need to go and do, which we definitely haven't had the opportunity to do yet. I can't remember yeah. what the castle's called. Terrible, but yeah. Well, that oh, sounds okay. Do you get a crown at the end when you have completed all the castles? That's oh, I don't know. You're going to make the prize. There we go. Badge. Yes, I will do that. Surely, I can be the prize. Definitely. <laughs> crown. <laughs> definitely need a badge for all of that effort. Yes. Yes. I don't know about crowns. Oh. <laughs> Wouldn't get that far. <laughs> Oh. Okay, and then um, me. Um, yes, you. This is a bit. <laughs> this is a bit weird um, for me because we're recording this in December, and I am two weeks away from some major surgery. Not life threatening. Um, just uh, pretty hefty surgery. And if you're a woman of a certain age listening to this, you'll know exactly what kind of surgery I'm about to go in for. Um, so it means that for six weeks all the way up until the end of January, I'm going to be laid up and unable to leave the house really. Although I am threatening to be wheeled in so I can oversee the new displays going and they're not doing it without me. I've worked damn hard on these. So I want to see them go in. Um, but yeah, I'm not really supposed to leave the house from now until the end of February. It was bad enough not being able to leave Worcester. I'm going to go crazy. Um, but I have uh, many, many books um, to read and also the York University their series of open lectures that they've been doing this year are all online and all on YouTube so those will be my at home very very at home cultural things and then I don't have a wider national cultural thing for January my sites are all pinned on at some point in the new year um, when I'm recovered and I can walk around for hours again um, we're planning to go to Paris. So I have an international cultural thing. And I That's want to go to podcast. Amazing. <laughs> I want to go to Paris, not for the cakes particularly or the Louvre or anything uh, that kind of all leaves me cold. Um, I want to go for the Père Lachaise Cemetery um, because I have a bit of an obsession with big metropolises or necropolises or basically cities of the dead. Um, especially Victorian ones or ones from around that era slightly later. Um, yeah, I'm a little bit obsessed with them, not quite as obsessed as my friend in Birmingham who's doing a PhD on them, um, but enough to mean that for me a good day out is a cemetery and a tea shop. <laughs> so we're going to Paris and I love there's so much in them. There's history and there's art and there's social history and there's nature and the, they are just incredible places um so yes paris and so that's my international cultural thing that i will achieve sometime when i'm better next year who knows that's when amazing <laughs> and i love that as well of all the reasons to go to paris because it's the city of love because of the fantastic yeah. food for the graveyard that's incredible I really don't want to see the mona lisa and i just want to see where jim yeah. Harrison is buried so. yes yes oh, and you, have, you, have you ever visited a charnel house no or at least What's not one knowing of those? It. it's a house that has got bones buried under the in the cellar is that right yeah I, it's, I only i just know that there's do you know the bishop's house next to the cathedral is a yes. is a charnel house I and, i've um, been in there but i didn't know that yes and i just Ooh. sort of um yeah it's sort of, i was looking flicking through a book of london you know weird things to do in london and i found a charnel house in london yeah um, that i would that i thought because i quite like going to visit like tiny tiny little museums that are mm. very peculiar or just yeah. like something that you can pass in the street but you wouldn't necessarily give it a second glance if you didn't mm. know its history or or, or or what it was and sometimes yeah. those things are quite interesting just to you know you walk yeah. an hour to get to them and then you look at it for about three minutes potentially <laughs> <laughs> it's just you're glad that you did it because it's yeah. sort of I don't know so yes I Yes, perhaps. Can I add another one? I'd like to go and see a charnel house. In the <laughs> there we yes, go. You can. We'll go and find one together. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm so looking forward to it. And then, of course, Paris. You've got all the kind of undercrofts and cellars that are um, 
I can't remember what the word is, but and it's not charnel house, it's called something else, but they're, um, it's the bones of people who are buried in them. Um, you find them a lot under monasteries and places like that, abbeys. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I fulfilled an ambition last year. Unfortunately, on the hottest day of my life, it was about 38 degrees in London, but we did do Highgate and we're very grateful for the tree coverage. Um, but it's just, it's such a wonderful place. And it's kind of one of the big seven that I've got to tick off. And I did yeah. that last year. It was amazing. I was very grateful <laughs> to my boyfriend, who was not only the hottest day of the year, but he was quite hungover. <laughs> and oh, he God. still managed it. <laughs> I owe him one. We'll have to probably have to go to a brewery or something to pay him back. But <laughs> I'm sure there'll be some nice alcohol you can find in Paris somewhere. Uh, so. Yeah, oh, I'm, sure. yeah I, I'm not worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> well, on that note, beer and bones, that sounds a good place to end. <laughs> That's this my level. Podcast. <laughs> Come back next month to um, to hear whatever we're talking about then. And as I say, come back in the end of 2021 to discover if we managed to hit all our targets, how many graveyards and bones we have seen between us. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank that was you. really good. Thank all you, Tim. Right, okay, no problem. Thank you. Bye. 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 See you all soon. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Inside the Museum is recorded and produced by Tudor House Museum as part of our Revealing the Past project, which is kindly funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. The original idea came from Frankie Eckentap. The music in this episode was by Kevin MacLeod. You can follow us on social media at Tudor House Wuss or visit our website www.tudorhouse.org.uk where you can also find Tim's blog. Our normal opening hours are Wednesdays to Saturdays, 10am to 4pm. We are closed for January 2021, but hope COVID restrictions permitting to reopen in February. Tudor House Museum is free to visit, but we do ask that under the current circumstances you pre-book your visit. Information on how to do so can be found on our website. Thanks for listening.